Yeah, this is a real honor for me. Uh, we're here at Velodyne. I, I used to uh, sell some of their audio equipment back in the 1980s in, my, in the consumer electronics store I managed. But now they make uh, these things called LiDARs, which are little spinning uh, laser systems that uh, enable the self-driving car. And I wanted to come and meet the inventor to find out what's next. So uh, who are you? Dave Hall. What am I? I'm kind of an enigma, I guess. I kind of like do my own thing, kind of stay out of everybody else's face as much as I can. And, uh, you know, try to amuse myself about the things that I can build. And uh, I find it never endingly amusing to build things that mostly the people have never seen before. And, uh, you know, what happens over the time is we've got much better, better tools than I had when I was a kid. And now you have SolidWorks and you have computer-aided everything. And it's amazing how productive you can be. And, you know, in a weekend you can whip out a circuit or a new product or a thing that used to took a year to do. And so now it's like you wonder just how much stuff you could build with these new tools and how fast you could do it. So I'm actually trying to, like I'm in the candy store. You know, I can whip out these 3D models and do some electronics and have that all made for me. And, and I get a 3D printer, you know, so this stuff just shows up. And uh, I'm just fascinated with how, yeah. what you can do these days. Well, there really is a renaissance of hardware uh, entrepreneurs all over the world. I'm seeing all sorts of jewelry with electronics in it and uh, new kinds of sensors. In, in Cambridge, England, there's a whole group of people building all sorts of stuff with these uh, Raspberry Pi computers, right? Yeah, you can you can almost just sit down and imagine something and have it ready on your desk Monday morning if you know how to get this stuff made. And it's really kind of uh, uh, the biggest revolution I've seen in my lifetime is the, how fast you can go through and make new product. Yeah, but well, you've been doing the hardware for a long time. I mean, I, I used to sell your uh, subwoofers in the 1980s. Yeah, right? we used to draw them on pen pencil and paper, you know, and craft them out and have a little drawing. And uh, and then the printer circuit board, we had tape, you know, the little, little uh, you put the tape down on the mylar. And uh, you could still make some product with it. And you had to be a little careful with it because it was a little hard to make revs. But, uh, you know, we got the job done and uh, it, was, it, was, uh, it was a lot of fun yeah. back in those days. Well, I, yeah. I took pictures of your LiDAR and put it up on Facebook, and somebody said, isn't that the company that makes the subwoofers? And he didn't quite get the point that it's the same company, right? <laughs> well, there's a story behind that, because uh, when this building, I built this building back in, uh, in the peak, you know, when there wasn't any space back at 2000, and then so we built this whole thing to make subwoofers in the back. And so I had a, a whole factory here, the, the trucks come in one end and the trucks go out the other end. And so I had this factory running for nine months. And then it became perfectly obvious that we should have just uh, send it all to China because China had, at that time, wiped out all my suppliers and were doing a much better job than I could get. And mostly I couldn't get the parts anymore because all the, the infrastructure was gone. So we said, okay, well, this is obviously, so we shipped the whole production, we got rid of it, and it's all over there, and it still is over there now. So I had this big building, so I started to look around for, i got to find something to fill this building because I really kind of missed the production. And uh, so I, I kind of looked around into the robot space because I thought it would be cool. And then I got into the Grand Challenge. And I really got into that to try to find a product that I could come up because it was going to be a big business. You know? So I wanted to come up with a product that I could fit in the back of my building and build it here in, in the United States. So it had to be expensive. It had to be hard to manufacture. It had to be state-of-the-art stuff. So I came with this. I really honed in on this LiDAR as was going to fill the need for what self-driving cars are. And it was a high dollar volume, kind of hard to make, and it would fit perf basically perfectly in the back of my buildings that I already had. So it was kind of like trying to fill a need here rather, you know, so this is kind of how it came about. There's a 60, tell me what this thing is. And because people might have seen the self-driving car or a mapping car driving around and they see something spinning on top, and it's probably one of your uh, LiDAR units, one of these two units. I'm sure, because I'm the only thing guy that spins on top of anybody's cars. So, yeah. so this was uh, a unit that was designed really for the, it was the, the second generation after the, I built the perf, perf, first prototype in 2005. And to give you an idea, so I, st I had the idea in February, and it was on my car running in September. 
in the race. So it wasn't actually six months old. So the paint was still dry on it. I was still writing software as we were driving to Las Vegas to run it. And I got some use out of it, but I, I was kind of hoping that there would be a third race and that by the time the third race came around, I'd really be in a position that, that nobody could touch me. But unfortunately, a bunch of people won the second race and then that was the end of that. So, you know, every time I try to predict what the government's going to going to do, I always get it wrong. So, I, you know, they, they told but me. You're talking the, about the DARPA, the Grand, DARPA Grand, Grand Challenge. You know, they already announced the two million. First, the worst was a million, then it was two million, and then the next race is going to be four million. Well, four million starts to get interesting, you know. So I figured for sure there was going to be there wasn't going to be any winner in the second race, and they'd go for the third race for the four million, and then, of course, they had winners for the second race, and that was the end of that. So, so then I had the sensor lying around, and then we sort of campaigned at DARPA to have the third race so that we could sort of show, you know. So there was kind of unwritten discussion about I'd sell these things to other teams and they would have a race that would kind of urban and not too fast because I didn't think these things were really freeway speed. So so then we took the original design, or I did, and I, I, I squoze it into this thing and uh, put a nice shape to it. You know, this was my, my attempt at being artistic. This is my yeah. one and only attempt to, to, to do art. And, um, and then we had these things out for 2007 or so. And then it took us a couple of years to actually get, you know, this thing evolved over time and we got, got some new parts came into it. And it started to work pretty good about 2008, I suppose. And then, and this is the same unit that um, Google's using yeah. on their cars. And then we sort of took, a, smaller direction attempting to get into what we thought would be uh, low speed mobile or low speed robotics like robot like uh, lawnmowers and stuff and uh, so this is sort of what how that was conceptually came about yeah and this you want to so turn the, that off? oh yeah uh, in uh, in here there's what 64 lasers that are sweeping every tenth of a second or something or like yeah so it's a it's a it's a modified it's basically what's called a line scan I guess, I, I don't know if there's a line scan LiDAR. There's a line scan camera, but uh, actually the whole idea of this is uh, I used to race bicycles and they used to have a, a camera that would film the finish line and the uh, film would go across a slot and 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 then it would form a, a linear picture of the bicyclist running. So I thought, yeah, that's a great idea. i got to use that for something. And uh, and then so this was, this idea is that, that, that it's, it, it makes it a 64 lasers, and then it, the mechanically sweeping it, so that I get to, I get to redundantly use, and I make the same type of picture as that I used to saw see in the uh, that they used to develop for the bicycle races. So I was making the same picture by sweeping it around, and it's a fairly cost-effective use of lasers. You know, the lasers they're not cheap, and the detectors are kind of complicated. So this is a way of recycling them so that you get a lot of use out of them. But yet the picture comes out essentially real time, which is what we needed to do for cars. Is there were there's other stuff out there that'll make a picture if you wait a while. But the real what we had to do is we had to have an instantaneous picture of what was going on out there. So this had to be simul pseudo simultaneous. And that's where I sort of came up with this as a is a good compromise between a total array of lasers, which was could still be built, but it's pretty complicated. And versus a single laser, which is spinning very fast, which a lot of other units are doing. So it's sort of a hybrid approach, you know, sort of a compromise. But yeah. I thought it was what you needed to get the job done. So it was kind of fun because I was designing the first one. You know, I had never seen it, one of these images before that this thing came out. So I was kind of like figuring out, like, you know, what, how many lines it should have and where it should point. And uh, so I, I came up with this and uh, without ever seeing it. So when I first turned it on, it was actually kind of cool, you know. It's like, hey, this is a picture. I can sort of see what's going on. And, um, and it turns out that, that this is the same geometry as my first prototype that I've never seen it work before I turned it on. So it's, I don't know if it's correct or not, but it's, it's history dates back to the design before I'd ever seen anything run. So I'm kind of proud cool? that I was able to. It's still alive after all these years. Uh, we used it on the parking lot to take video of Rocky, <laughs> who's a running camera. Uh, and it, it, it shows up to 100 meters away, and it shows up in fairly good detail. Right? Uh, uh, it shows all the signs and the trees and the stripes on the, on the pavement and everything. Right? Well, 
it does that, and I'm, you know, just from an inventor point of view, you know, it's like you get these ideas that it might do that if it ever got it built and turned it on. And, <laughs> <laughs> it's and actually, it's actually working better than my than than I had ever imagined it would. So. Uh, a lot of work has gone on the back to improve this thing. So there's a lot of a lot of people working long hours that yeah. made a lot of tweaks to this thing. So it's working pretty good these days. So I, at the Consumer Electronics Show, I, I interviewed and I forget his name. I'm really bad with names, but he runs the autonomous uh, vehicle division of BMW, and I talked to the CTO of Ford, and both of those guys think that truly autonomous cars are still 10 to 20 years away. Um, do you agree or disagree? Well, I think if I don't do it, it might be 10 or 20 years away, and or someone else is going to do it. So, you know, if Google steps up, then fine, they can get it done. But uh, it's not that it's 10 or 20 years. I'm not even sure I like their approach, which is to leave the driver still in charge of the vehicle. And so I try to imagine, it's like, how could I make that happen when, you know, you're sort of admitting that your product doesn't work that well and it's going to fail. And, you know, if it fails, it's like, the driver that I have imagining replacing is my mother, who's 89 and still drives around, even though she lost an eye in an accident. You know, it doesn't stop her. You know, she's still going. And it's like this is not the person I want taking over my car if it gets itself in trouble. This just isn't going to work. So I don't see it as a practical approach. And in some of it, it makes it harder because now you have to anticipate that your car is going to somehow screw up before. It's sooner because you got to tell the driver or something, and 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 maybe if you could train the drivers, the you know get a, go to school or something like that to what to do when your car freaks out. But I don't see it as a I don't see <laughs> driver, <it> a, <laughs> driver car freak out driver training. <laughs> I mean, you could do it. You know, pilots are trained to do to take yeah. over in case of emergencies, but you know they're highly trained. Yeah, I just was flying with somebody, and he he just passed his his uh, uh, tests for all the emergencies that, uh, you know, they turn off an engine or, or uh, turn off both engines or, uh, you know, uh, throw some wild weather at them. You know, you have to well, handle and it all. Yeah, and you, you've got to be a professional in order to do that. So I, I, so I think there's some questions about how, you know, how you get there from here. And my avocation is just bite the bullet and go for perfection. And I think this is Google's approach, too. Is just get it so it works, and and whether or not how far along you can get on that, uh, you know. So this is this is my approach, and then and then also you have to be cognizant that electronic stuff fails from fairly frequently. Actually, if, if you look at your failure, your iPads and iPhones and your laptops, is, is electronics is not a perfect thing, and, and mechanically you can make cars that are actually pretty reliable, but as soon as you throw a lot of electronics in it. You know, if, if you imagine how many times your laptop has crashed in the last three years, you can't have that type of failures going on in the car. Yeah, even if it's one out of a million hours, uh, it, you that's know, still pretty You have a lot serious. of cars on the road. And a lot of cars, and you know, and it's and a lot of it's hardware problems too. And, it's, and the temperature can be quite extreme out there, so it's a pretty tough environment. So now, not only do you have to design the car to, to, to the algorithms to correct right, but you also have to have fault tolerant that, that if any one subsystem. Uh, fails that you, you don't kill anybody. So it's not a trivial problem when you add up what to do, but it's also not unreachable. So compared to what other people are doing out there and the sophistication of programs that we see going on other things, it's well within the realm of what can be done. So it's just like, is it is it bigger problem than me working part-time on weekends doing it? Well, maybe. Not too much more, but you know, it doesn't really have the, the, the you know, where the momentum is going to come from. And so from a, from a financial point of view, you know, you're talking about investing a lot of time now for something that you don't quite know how you're going to get paid back, and you don't know if you're going to get sued, and you don't really know how to test it. So it's kind of, it's kind of, it would be here. I don't think it's technologically, although the car companies would differ from you because they're not, they're not computer guys, they're not electronic guys, they're, they're basically mechanical, and this is really out of their wheelhouse. Is they are not, you know, you don't go to Detroit to find computer experts. You, they're, they're around here, you know. Making here chips. being Morgan Hill, Morgan Hill South, or, South San Jose. Or, no, well, in, in Silicon Valley, yeah. you know, is where are the electronics, you know, so people around here would be much more comfortable 
writing some software, but you go out to Detroit and they're basically mechanical engineers. So, and as an electronic engineer, they're electrical engineer, or electronics engineer, or computer, whatever. They're a little bit out of the wheelhouse. So, you know, and and it's a car. Self-driving car is a robot, in my opinion. It's a ro you're designing a robot to drive a car. It's, it has nothing to do with a car. It's it's something that's added into a car that drives it, and. So I'm uh, I'm thinking this is a robot, and you know, how many people make robots? Well, you know, it's it's, it's kind of a rare, and, you know, there there are manufacturing robots around, but you know, this artificial intelligence robots. There's a little bit of work going around on it here, but you know, this this type of work isn't being done in Detroit. So. The, the Some of it, it, but even the Detroit car companies have R and D centers here in Silicon Valley. They are, and I think that's sort of encouraging. But uh, you know how the car companies evolve. You know, it re represents change. And the way car companies, the way cars are sold, is they're sold based upon excitement of how you drive them, almost exclusively. Like if you look at Mercedes ads, even Ford, it's 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 you know, look how exciting driving. So, so the whole idea that you're going to sell a car to someone that really hates driving is so anti-corporate. You know, it's just it, it explodes their minds. It's like, okay, well, well, we, we've we've sold because we got brand loyalty, because people love the car and love driving a new car, and now we have to like convince everybody that no, you were always wrong. You hated driving a car, and here's a car for you, people that hate driving a car. And so, corporately, it just explodes the whole marketing plan out the window, and. So I think they have, you know, and this represents change, and change is very difficult to get through a big corporation, even small corporations. My size change is, you know, that's one thing I've learned is people do not like change. As a rule, it's like you want to change things. It's really difficult. It's, yep. It's a real problem. These these uh, cost uh, thirty to seventy thousand dollars somewhere in that range. Right, so they're not they're not going to be bought by normal people right now for hooking on their Toyota, you know, and and turning their Toyota into a self-driving car, right? Yeah, but the uh, the next one I'm coming out with will be in the range of affordability, so it'll mm -hmm. be cheaper than your camera, and uh, but more expensive than your iPhone, somewhere in there, and uh, uh, so you actually could put it on top of your car and drive down the road with it. You know, we visited Autodesk, talked to the uh, Autodesk CTO, and he, he was showing us some of the ways they use LiDAR in, in building reconstruction and stuff like that. We, we saw some video of a drone carrying one of these that went up and down a, a building to uh, render a building, right? There, there's other uses than just self-driving cars for this stuff. Yeah. The things that are actually more successful are uh, there's self-driving mining trucks that use this. The Caterpillar has... Uh, uh, a mine that they're running these things, these big three-story, uh, thousand-ton trucks are rumbling around with no drivers in them down in Australia and have been for a while. So that's a success story. Um, they're used for mapping, uh, so there's a, the biggest fleet is actually, you, you'll see these on the back of specialized vehicles spinning away, but there's a bunch of other equipment hanging off of them. And there's two or three or four rigs that have been seen around the Bay Area that have very either this one or that one yeah. driving I, around the back of I them. I think the reason I got your an interview yeah. with you is I was driving down to CES and I saw both your car and and several other cars. I saw a Bing mapping car, right? And uh, the Google's mapping car has this on there. No, actually, the Google one might not. No, the Google uh, one. Uh, but I, I've, I've seen others that have I don't the know. spinning. Yeah. yeah. If they have the spinning one, that's mine. Because yeah. I'm the only spinning one, but there's there's two or three n mapping companies that are been seen around, yeah. uh, and they're making nice 3D maps, and they got and they colorize them and stuff, and then eventually you're on your smartphone, you get a perspective view of what you're looking at. I think I think they're actually out there working, but I don't know. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's nobody tells me any of this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> what. Um, you know, it, it, does it pose a challenge to run two s sort of separate businesses all in one building? Because we, we have some headphones here that you sell, and you still sell the subwoofers, right? Still. And they're still awesome subwoofers. <laughs> they're still the best in the business that everybody, everybody uh, tells me. This started out as a subwoofer business, and then, and then I got the LiDAR going, and it was sort of over everyone's dead body, frankly, to, to, you know, because it was an orphan project that nobody wants to work on because everybody knows that subwoofers are the, the big thing, and if you get transferred to the LiDAR division, it means your ne next step is out the door, you know. 
So it, it was very difficult to, uh, and I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't advocate anybody do that again. So you know, you're better off to do the Silicon Valley as like just start fresh, open a new building, hire people that want to work on that project, that, that get excited about it. But don't try to take an audio person and turn them into a lidar person. It's, it's, just, it's just sometimes, it, you know, it's like we're all out here because we get juiced by what we're working on, and you know, some people just can't go from one to the other. Most people don't. So There are some similarities though. In the subwoofer you used uh, sensors to figure out whether whether the subwoofer was distorting. Am I right? Well that's for me because I look for stuff that's electrical and mechanical and uses some of both because that's what I am good at. You know, So I may not be the best electrical engineer or the best mechanical but I combine the two. So I look for projects that are both. And the subwoofer I liked because it had electronic uh, accelerometer and a mechanical portion of the subwoofer that went back and forth. And then I like this LiDAR because it's a, it has a mechanical part in it, you know, it spins around. And, uh, uh, and then the, the boat is also electrical and mechanical combination of the, those two. T so. Tell me about the boat. Uh, so that's a, a, a robot. It's a feat of electrical mechanical engineering is really what it is. So it's a statement of what I, I think I can do as an electrical mechanical engineer. So it just turns out to happen to be a boat, but it's, a, it's an impressive statement of, uh, it's me showing off basically. So the boat itself is uh, articulated on pontoons and the deck is, is elevated or levitated so that it stays flat and level even though the pontoons are going up and over the waves. And the benefit of it is uh, you don't get seasick. And, and true enough, you know, the boat's been through a lot and no one's ever complained of getting seasick on it. So, you know, I think it's got some commercial potential as soon as people get used to the idea that this is a change in the way boating is all about. And, you know, the hardest thing about boating is like the people who are in boating don't get seasick, you know, they don't mind about it. So now you're trying to sell a boat to someone who doesn't like boating. <laughs> <laughs> well, cool. Um... What, next is you're, you're trying to cost reduce, make the smaller, open up new markets. Well, I think I'm going to try to dive into this self-driving car and, and see if I can't. Uh, you know, I, I spent a lot of time driving it from here to Alameda, and I'm saying, you know, there's got to be a way to make this easier. I mean, just between the time it takes me to get up there, I can invent a way. The, 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 this car could go on a road all by itself. This is, this is starting to look like not such a hard problem compared to how hard it is to keep your mind focused on driving when you're going for an hour and you're in traffic. Yeah. And, and uh, so I, I'm I, thinking that... I remember going to Stanford and uh, interviewing Mike Montla Merlot, yeah. Mike Montla Merlot, back in 2007, when, right after he won, was one of the winners of the Grand Challenge. And it still seemed like science fiction to me. I was like, I don't know if you're ever going to be able to get a car to drive itself. But now, no, it doesn't seem like science fiction at all. Yeah, some of that is just the confidence that it can be done. And then you're willing to spend the time to do it. And so, you know, from an inventor point of view, if, if you see someone else do it, then it's like, that's oh, a no-brainer, you know, that's easy. People can just go to copy it, you know. So, so some of it is like... You sort of have to convince yourself that it, it can be done, and and then you have to see a way to do it. And, I, uh, I just entered, a couple of weeks ago. I interviewed uh, Dick Fosbury. He invented the backward uh, high jump. And oh yeah. He said most of the work that he did in in training was to convince himself that he could do it. <laughs> I would never. Do. I don't know how he came that that Fosbury flop. Yeah, he said he was the worst on his high school team. Yeah. And he had to innovate to to yeah. make sure he got back on the team next year because he wasn't going to make the team doing it the way everybody else was. <laughs> yeah, he was quite a uh, quite an innovator. It's one of the that's one of the top stories of innovation, actually. I don't know how he came up with that, but uh, yeah. brilliant. Anyways, uh, thanks for spending some time. All right. If you have anything else that you'd like to talk to me about, I'd, I'd be. Uh, you're an interesting guy and uh, a big well. figure in Silicon Valley, and you've been doing hardware from. Uh, you know, way before it was cool or easy, you know, now everybody on a, on a Kickstarter project is starting a little hardware thing, but, you know. Well, I'm in it to amuse myself, how clever I am, so. Very cool. Well, thank you so much. And, uh...